Here he is. I hit record right as you were opening the door. <laughs> I have to apologize. I've yet to unpack the vacuum cleaner. I was, I'm just going to take it to mine first. You think I can? Yeah, and then, of course. Actually, that's, that's actually works perfectly. And then if I use it here first and then there, then you can't all over my room. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. It's actually good. Ideal. I thought about this last night as I was sleeping. I slept for like 12 fucking hours. I know, it's crazy. I, I assumed you'd left. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I went to sleep. 5 p.m., 1 a.m. That's amazing. 1 a.m. and then fell asleep again at like 2 or 4 and just woke up. First sleep and second sleep. Do you know about this? Yeah, the old days. In the old days? Back when we were farmers. Well, those of you who wake up in the middle of the night and think that this is a bad thing, know that it's actually very natural to sleep in two in two goes. Before the invention of electricity, there's a lot of evidence that people did, did sleep in... Uh, in a first sleep and a second sleep. And that hour in between or two hours in between were important times for reflection and intimacy and all sorts of things, right? It also took three months to cross the Atlantic before electricity, but that doesn't mean it's it's the proper way to do it. <laughs> oh, you're so you're such a believer in modernity, aren't you? Um, try and get the mic closer to you than usual because I don't want it to uh, pick up the piano as much Twice. as your voice. Exactly. I mean, it, it does pick up the piano, but today we're going to try something uh, slightly different. Uh, I've been playing the piano for the last hour and a half and was just really uh, wanting to play a little bit more. And um, when I met Patrick, he was working and I think he's still working <laughs> on, a, uh, yes. on a book against elegance. And um, I grew up with the concept of elegance being the, the just purely a, a wonderful good thing. Uh, my father was always described as elegant, especially in his manner of dress and his manner of movement. Um, and I was just grew up thinking like, there's nothing better than elegance and uh, one should strive for that. And it wasn't until I met Patrick that I heard a, an opposing view. And um, I, of course, I was immediately intrigued. And then, and then Patrick came to the Bombay Beach Biennale, uh, both the, the third and the fourth ones. And, uh, and last year he gave a talk uh, kind of outlining his journey into the concept of elegance and against the concept of elegance. And I would love today for you to kind of just uh, share those views a little bit with us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so it... I was trying to be a proper neuroscientist, right? Which mm -hmm. means <clears throat> you want to be able to understand the, the like qualities and conditions of what makes science good mm -hmm. and what kinds of science, what kinds of scientific results are good, what kinds of experiments are good, what, what, are, what are we doing this for? Where, where are we aiming ourselves? Where are we aiming our attention and our, and our focus? And an editor, um, so I was in grad school at Stanford, and an editor came and uh, from a prestigious journal and came and said that the qualities of a paper in this prestigious journal, which can make or break a career, often uh, those scientists among us will know which one I'm talking about, that if you have just a single first author paper in there, you have a career. Your career is good. You have a job. And she was asked what the qualities of, of such a paper are, and she said, well, you know, there's kind of, it's, it's multidisciplinary. There's a lot of exciting methods there. It's, it's done really well. Um, it's surprising. And there's a certain, and then she had been making eye contact the whole time with the room, you know, that, that kind of like the lecturer style. And I swear, she, she looked down at the ground. And I swear, I might have been imagining this, but I swear I saw her like cheeks blush. And she said, and there's a certain elegance. And it just set me off. I went, I went and asked my PhD advisor, Bob Spolsky. I was like, what is elegance? And he's like, I don't know. You know it when you see it. Which is that very classic uh, John, John Potter, Justice Potter, Justice Potter um, Supreme Court response to what is obscenity, what right. is pornography, you right. know when you see it. Yeah. Which is, of course, a dodge. But, of course, it isn't a dodge. What it's saying is that our intuition knows. We know. It's, it's, it's got like fuzzy edge cases. The borders are hard to define like a cloud. The borders are hard to define. The more you zoom in, the more confused you are. And 
So this just set me off on like a five year quest to understand elegance all through my postdoc, all through after, where I tried to deeply understand what it, what is the role of elegance in understanding the brain and what is the role of elegance in neuroscience. And I ended up having to do almost like a proof by analogy because nobody knows what it is. Nobody, people have definitions, but they don't have a good definition. What are some of those definitions? Well, so I don't, so I don't do that. And I don't, this is very frustrating. This is frustrating to my publisher. Mm -hmm. This is frustrating to the New Yorker. I wrote a New Yorker piece about it. I don't define it uh -huh. because I don't think it's worth defining it because that only gives people um, room to agree or disagree. And I find room to agree to be even more destabilizing than room to disagree because as soon as someone agrees with the definition, they kind of don't care about the rest of the argument. Okay. I, I, I give talks on schizophrenia and I don't define schizophrenia. It's not, to me, it's about triangulating for, for fuzzy concepts, for things that are unknown when there is no good definition, when the, the heart of the concept is actually its differences between people, the definition doesn't matter to me. I'll get there. I had to have one. My publisher required it, <laughs> but I don't like anchoring with that. So, so, and in, in part because <clears throat> like, I both think there is a, there is not a general definition, nor is everybody's definition correct. So there's something in between. And I'm more interested in the, the moments of translation between your version of elegance and someone else's version of elegance and my version of elegance. Why are we using the same word? Mm -hmm. Why in Monterey, California, at the Pebble Beach Golf Course, is there a concours d'elegance, which is a, a, a car race, not of speed, but of elegance, that has a Bentley car motor VIP party in like a Harvard Cambridge alumni event in a rented out house in this most expensive golf course in the world. And then over in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there are men who call themselves the Society of Ambiance Makers for the Preservation of Elegance in the middle of the Congo who spend all of their credit and all of their life savings to buy some Italian loafers to look a little bit like the European fashion that their colonial masters had instituted hundreds of years ago and from from Belgium and had used fashion and had used that clothing as a kind of signature for Belgian favor and now hundreds of years many generations later you have people imitating that in the in the Congo while over on the other like almost anti-podal on the exact other side of the world in Monterey you have people what buying Bentley cars because the Queen of England bought a Bentley because the Queen of England chose to drive a Bentley because the limousine is Bentley branded. Like, why do people do the things that they do? Why do they? Um, where does the imitation stop? Well, it sounds like you're 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 railing against the concept of classism, right? Well, yeah. So, is it our our, our elegance and classism kind of too intimately tied together for your comfort? So I had thought, I mean, my father was described as elegance and, and he was a prince. So like there is obviously oh, yeah. something yeah. there. I mean, the, the gentleman society in the Congo is not imitating a Congolese colony. They're imitating their colonial masters at the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the Bentley VIP party, they're not imitating like, you know, some, I don't know, just, uh, they're not, they're, it always you always imitate up right and so at first when i when i was investigating elegance i had presumed because i asked people what is elegance to you what is elegance what is elegance what is elegance and there was a dead end to this and i you know i was i was young in my investigative journalism career i've never investigated anything important in my life but um uh i i have developed some methods and the number one lesson was you don't ask people what elegance is if you want to know the definition of elegance, you don't ask them what elegance is. You ask them what the opposite of elegance is. Oh, interesting. And from that, you can you can you can create and draw the borders of what is not the concept, and therefore what you have left over is the concept. And I had presumed, if you just ask people what elegance is, uh, they'll give definitions about movement, like a ballerina is elegant, Michael Jordan, Roger Federer, people that people that are at the peak, peak, peak of their sport. People are at the peak, peak, peak of like athletic intention and movement um, where, where they, you know, by no coincidence, are they the best at what they do? They have this effortless economy that makes it look, they, 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 they like hide all of the trauma and pain of training and decades of practice under this like 
mask of expertise, this effortless mask of expertise. But that's not how most people see elegance. It's, it's, it's a class thing. I think there's two driving, there's three driving categories of descriptions of elegance. There's a kind of cleanness, there's upper classness, and there's efficient movement. And so every definition of elegance is going to be either about the cleanliness, sharpness of a concept, of a person, of mm-hmm. movement, mm-hmm. it's class structure, where you just have a straight up hierarchy and you inherit the things that people at the top of the hierarchy do are often elegant. The things that people at the bottom of the hierarchy do are often inelegant. When I asked, so the, one of the first things- so that includes a skill, a hierarchy. So that's why maybe someone who's really good at something is described as elegant. I think there's there are linkages between the categories that when you tend to, so, so the chapter I brought, which I'm going to do a reading of. Okay. I know that's gauche, but I realized on the way here, I was like, you know, what if this 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 analogy will not hold uh, uh, possibly historically, but it's like Chopin, you have Chopin in here and it's like, well, I know you wrote some sheet music down, but how about you just hum it? Right. <laughs> so, I, you know, some of these sentences I spent like years on. Um, so I want to do a short reading and, and it's something you've never heard. It's not the actual one I read at Bombay Beach. Okay. But I chose it because it's, exquisitely relevant to what we've been talking about on themes of this podcast okay it's about imitation it's about sex and gender it's about when the roles that we play the roles men play to be elegant the roles women play to be elegant and how devastating the pursuit of elegance can be Mm -hmm. and its effects all the way down to like the streets of los angeles um and it it just kind of so when i asked i realized about like year two that asking people directly what elegance is is not going to get anywhere not going to get me anywhere so i asked on uh amazon has this service mechanical turk which you can you can just ask a question to anybody and you have them like perform some sort of it's like a gig economy thing before the gig economy yeah the, the turk was the mechanical turk was an early chess uh, uh not fake computer right it was like being operated by someone it was like somebody was playing chess yeah, it looked, with this little, it looked like a robot, but it was actually being controlled by a human. So the idea of the mechanical Turk is that you think you're getting like AI, but you're actually just getting humans, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's humans all the way down. It's Soylent, Soylent, uh, Deep Blue, um, and a vast, vast, vast majority of the responses. So I, I paid for a thousand responses. You have to pay for for each thing. It was about class. It was low class. It was it was like Walmart. It was, um, you know, my neighbor when they sit out. I live in Texas. My neighbor when they sit outside on their abandoned couch smoking cigarettes, that's the opposite of elegance. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it was so two thirds of the answers maybe were about class. And I realized I was getting this wrong, that it wasn't about movement. And that if I was going to understand elegance, I was going to have to understand neuroscience as a field, almost as a sociologist or anthropologist might. Right. Because the pursuit of elegance is a pursuit of imita- of class. And I realized that what we have done as neuroscientists is we had imported the, the aesthetics and the structure of success from physics. Physics is a wild success in the 20th century. By the time we got to the 20th century, they're landing on the goddamn moon. They were splitting the atom, you know, like now we can like peer into the big bang. We can land autonomous cars on Mars. It's nuts what physics can do. And neuroscience has no idea what being sad is. We have nothing. We have nothing. We're in the Babylonian era and elegance as a concept in physics is about taking disparate observations. It's about taking the fact that you can drop a bowling ball on earth and you can drop a bowling ball on Mars and there's a unified principle of gravity. There's something that explains both. And so elegance works well. Yes, there are like turbulence and various different things where elegance doesn't work in physics, but in general, the pursuit of simplicity, the pursuit of cutting off the cutting off the fat, uh, uh, reducing disparate observations to a single simple equation. That is the holy grail of physics. Right. But biology is messy as all hell, right? We are just the, the like 3.5 billion year old, 
like downstream consequence of a single cell that grew up near a hydrothermal vent that was like too self-conscious to die and now we have inherited all of its legacy problems right. and we have all of our brains are just messy and built backwards and just like a bunch of piled on evolutionary mistakes and we think that's going to be elegant that's not going to be elegant just drop a bowling ball and a, and a pigeon from the same height yeah okay great physics you can tell us where the bowling ball lands but like you want to take a guess telling me where the pigeon lands a live That's pigeon you mean a live pigeon yeah, yeah a dead pigeon will fall at the rate of the bowling ball <laughs> go 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 physics yeah you you got that one you can explain a dead pigeon to me congratulations <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> Just to prepare people who don't like being read to, this is only uh, probably one minute per page, probably five or six minutes. And oh, we, okay. And then we can talk, we can talk some more. Great. Short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's short. And you can always just tune them out and listen to me instead. <laughs> <laughs> can you, uh, that interrupts my cadence. Can you do it, but just like a tiny bit slower? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great, great, great. No, they, we're working out this, this idea. And, and actually, uh, I think it's because I can hear it in. Dear readers, um, actually, I can turn it down for you. That will help. Oh, that will help. Hold on. Now talk? Yeah, elegance. Does that help? No, no that's the one thing I could say off the cuff. <laughs> that's the only thing I could spontaneously um, I defi Definitely, we, um, we're working this out as far as our, our voice uh, you know, in, and our tone in this podcast. So do feel free in the comments to tell us, like what works and what doesn't um do you like having interspersed piano here and there do you find it annoying um so do give us feedback in in the comment section thank Will you. you be able to listen and play absolutely okay, yeah. good 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 because i want to talk about it afterwards oh no no i'm very much listening to you in fact i probably listen in a way it focuses me believe it or not <laughs> okay great uh elegance is refusal in the garment district of downtown Los Angeles on the border of Skid Row, past the virtual reality arcade in the hip cafe with people searching their phones for le emoji juste. Tucked between half a dozen sliding steel doors, there's a small business called Rage Ground. Patrons are given a sledgehammer, a shovel, and a baseball bat so that they may destroy, depending on their mood, large things, i.e. tables, desks, computers, or small things, i.e. teacups, pictures, cassette tapes, or maybe even symbolic things, i.e teacups, pictures, cassette tapes, in the confines of a safe and private room. The clientele, according to one of the business's co-owners, a 23-year-old man who studies anthropology at the nearby Santa Monica College and whose mother is a psychiatrist, is 75% female. In the 1874 Etiquette Guide, a manual of etiquette with hints on politeness and good breeding, girls are told of Cordelia from King Lear, quote, her voice was ever sweet, gentle, and low, an excellent thing in a woman. In a section titled, quote, Wives, restraint is made even more explicit. Quote, domestic troubles will arise and domestic storms may sweep over the home, but the cheerful wife will possess the power to rise above them all, and a quiet, meek, submissive spirit will bring her to a safe harbor. Quote, but if you can learn to possess complete command over your own temper, you will be able to decrease the strength of your husband's temper, govern yourself, and you will learn how to govern others. According to these classic... According to these voices of classical manners, to be elegant is to be restrained, and to be restrained is to be in control of one's emotions. One must not boil over. Rage ground can be thought of in this context as a place to go to be inelegant in private. When I spoke to a group of five women after they spent half an hour in the rage room, it was clear that something more than etiquette and elegance was at stake. Quote, I can see a social aspect of it. We're not supposed to be aggressive, said one woman, who I'll call Pyro, for reasons that will be obvious later. Right. We're supposed to be so cool, calm, and collected, demure almost, and we don't get to voice our opinions all the time. And there's so many times where we just rise above and don't say anything. And then this is an outlet to let all that go, said another. Quote, yeah, in the workplace, when guys can get mad or angry, it's just like, quote, oh, he's whatever, he's just being a boss, or, quote, he's just doing his job, said another. But when a female does it, it's like, why are you in such a bad fucking mood today? Why are you such a bitch? When we're assertive, it's looked down on as if we're aggressive. We're bitches, we're rude, we're rude and not nice. But if a male were to do it, he's just being a boy. Or he's just being a boss, he's excelling his career. But when women do it, it's 
not taken the same way, and we have to tread so lightly every day. It feels like, said another. She paused. Quote, so this is completely an amazing outlet. Oh my gosh. I feel so calm. I feel almost euphoric, said Pyro. I feel like my endorphins are all the way up, said another. Yeah, I'm really happy right now, said another. I've broken my phone a couple times, especially in high school. I would just, said Pyro. She would also set things on fire. She's my little cousin, and she's a little Pyro. At any birthday or anything, she's like, quote, let me light the candles. And she'd just like to set shit on fire. It's ten years later, said Pyro. I've obviously got the fire thing under control. But when my parents moved out of their house that we grew up in, I had all of these posters on the wall, which I hung myself. And my dad was upset because when he moved them, he's like, are you fucking kidding me? There are all these holes in the wall. What's that from? And I'm like, that's for my phone. That's for my lamp. That's for my fist. Another in the group said the Rage Room reminded her of the book School Girls by Peggy Orenstein. Quote, it's basically a book about girls when they're going through their adolescence, how they are treated differently in school, and how it shapes the way they feel about themselves. The negative body images and the ways they act out versus boys. If a boy is rambunctious in class and talks out of turn, he's the class clown. He's funny. When a girl does it, she's disobedient. And so, girls become less and less outgoing. They raise their hand less in class, they answer questions less in class, and they don't get as good grades. It's a decline as they progress through schooling. The environment in Hollywood circa 2017 and in Kenya circa 1983 have more in common than one might think. In both, the established social hierarchies of a troop of primates were in flux at the sweeping and near instantaneous loss of alpha males from the top of the ranks. In a primate's memoir, Robert Sapolsky recounts his field research on the forest troop of baboons in the early 80s and the consequences after almost half of the males were felled during a bovine tuberculosis outbreak linked to tainted meat. And in Los Angeles, the Me Too movement was in its inaugural season, and two, like tuberculosis, had just begun to spread. The $64,000 are we like them or are they like us question being, to Hollywood and Kenya both, would the hierarchy, absent the alpha males, reform into its previous shape, or would it change to be, perhaps, matriarchal? And how did Rage Ground fit in? The primatologist Franz de Waal, author of Chimpanzee Politics and Our Inner Ape, told me that it is very common for socially marginalized primates to displace aggression. Quote, if primates are tense or lose a fight or are frustrated, they take it out on some easy target. It seems like this rage room is a sort of extension of that, said DeWall. If manners and elegance are forms of reduction, one has to ask, can this go too far? Is Hollywood molting in response to millennia of forced constraint? When Coco Chanel says elegance is refusal, I wondered, how does one know when to stop? What were the consequences of compression? I knew just who to ask. A classic example in the arts of reduction gone awry is Marianne Moore's five-decade-long revision of her famous poem, Poetry, down to just three lines. I, too, dislike it. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers in it, after all, a place for the genuine. There was a backlash when she published this version in 1967, cribbed from the 32 lines of the original. Her fans cried that she went too far, that she had ruined her own art. The poet Robert Pinsky wrote in Slate of the debate, Many readers, including numbers of Moore's fellow poets, consider this one of the most egregious examples ever of a terrible revision. I was intrigued by his take on Moore's reason, which sounded to me like Moore had declared war on elegance itself. Quote, Moore, as I understand her project, champions both clarity and complexity, rejecting the shallow notion that they are opposites. Scorning a middle-brow reduction of everything into easy chunks, she also scorns obfuscation and evasive cop-outs. I asked more about the tension between clarity and complexity, and about whether there was something in common between Moore's reductions and, say, Ed Witten's reduction from 26 to 10, the number of dimensions in the universe, or Cordelia's reduction of her voice in the court of men. Witten, too, was accused of cutting too many dimensions. Pinsky was coy, responding with a story about jazz great Miles Davis. Quote, there's a drummer, and Davis is trying to get the drummer to play slower. He wants the tempo slower, and so he says, quote, like this, and, 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 but the drummer won't do it. He says, okay, let me give it to you, and, and, but the drummer can't do it. And finally, Davis says, okay, let me give it to you. I asked whether Moore's actions in the Miles Davis story were, in some ways, stories against ornamentation. Quote, Modernism in poetry is exactly dedicated to that, said Pinsky. He mentioned a book about Ezra Pound called The Poet is Sculptor. The Ezra Pounds, the William Carlos Williams, and Marianne Moore tried to sweep away our ornament. 
Pinsky gave me a line from a short witty poem as a definition of elegance via reduction. Quote, say what you will in two words and get through. Long frilly palaver is silly. He was intrigued by the etymology of elegance. The root is like, like a lection. It's choosing. I was going right to class because it's also the root of elite. To say choice is to say elite. If, quote, common is an opposite, it occurs to me that a synonym is the use of needless choice. You know the famous Spencer Tracy thing about Catherine Hepburn? There's not much meat on her, but what there is is choice. He chooses to pronounce it churse to vulgarize it a little bit, but he's also talking about elegance. The poet and critic Hannah Sol uh, Sullivan complicated this simple notion that poetry is just an excision from prose or life. She disagrees with the idea of a writer as mere sculptor and thinks about language as expansion, liking it more to the phrase, quote, infinite use of finite means. Sullivan sees words as popping into consciousness by fiat sui generi, and a poem, a sentence, or any utterance is an act of filling outward, not reducing down from the infinite. Quote, however elegant a final sentence may be or a poem might be, it is not something that has been made out of a massive set of possibilities. It is something that, is, that has been created from zero, from nothing. So I don't think poets are in fact choosing one out of a hundred possible words when they're thinking about a rhyme. That's not actually how language works. The rhyme is there first, in other words, and then the other words start, sort of happen around it. She also sees merit in some constraint, even in the oft-restricting rules of formal poetry. Rules are so constraining, they actually function like magic, like a charm. They allow you to think of concepts or places or people or fictional things that you would never otherwise come to. It's a different generative rule that produces a whole set of sentences that you wouldn't have come up with otherwise. In The Power of Glamour, Longing in the Art of Visual Persuasion, Virginia Postrel writes that a glamour originally meant a kind of hallucinatory magic spell like a charm. Sir Arthur Scott in 1805 wrote that a glamour could, quote, make a lady seem a knight. The cobwebs on a dungeon wall seem tapestry in lordly hall. Fascination and sprezzatura, similarly, had origins as spells, dispersions, or false appearances. Heather White, who edited Mary, Marianne Moore's work for a recent collection, told me that in her opinion, Moore was attempting to get rid of, quote, extraneous complexities from her early poems. Always by removing, I asked? Always by removing, never by adding. She said at one point that if you're not sure if something works, the most expedient cure is usually to delete it. How did she know when to stop, though? I asked. I think by the time she was in her 60s, which was when she was doing her major edition of her early work, she basically couldn't read her younger self anymore. She was about as confused by her poems as other people were, so she went back, and I think her mind, in her mind, she was just getting rid of complexities that didn't add anything, that just confused and obfuscated what she wanted to say, which I suppose in some definition could be her attempt to make them more elegant, certainly to simplify them and make them more direct, said White. Moore had also changed her mind, perhaps, about what poetry should do. Partly that was because World War II happened, said White, and a lot of people changed their mind about what art should accomplish. It was also partly because her mother died and that changed her life profoundly. There were a lot of reasons. I asked, and the revisions, they went too far in your opinion. For my money, said White, that was a huge mistake, since I think a lot of the value was in those complications and those strangenesses and those weird associative paths her mind took. The whole point was the path to getting there. You couldn't go back and get rid of what was extraneous without destroying the whole experience. The pleasures of Moore to White don't seem to have very much to do with elegance. But rather, like with the Congolese, it's about the journey. The pleasure of reading more, she said, has more to do with the, quote, wit, intensity, strangeness, and difficulty. She gave as an example a poem of Moore's, The Monkey Puzzle, which is, quote, about this sort of stunted, gnarled, complex tree. This is the joy of Moore. It is not elegance. And Moore went too far, said White, because many of her revisions lost this charm. Quote, I thought that they were simplified. I thought that they were purged of enigmas and engaged me more than the clarities that replaced them. I always felt like I was insisting on my right to be baffled. It wasn't necessary to me that I understand every line, and I resented it a lot, actually, when the things that puzzled me were removed. White mentioned Moore's brother and the impact he had on her editing as a possible reason. Quote, she was very close to both her mother and her brother, and her brother, who was not particularly literary, read everything that she wrote and gave her advice. She gave him some piece of writing, I don't remember what anymore, and he responded that she should starve it down and make it run. This stayed with her. She also starved herself. 
not because she cared how she looked, but for sort of related psychological reasons. So let's just say compression and concision and contraction were all very, very big with her. They were always big with her, and they just got sort of more and more so. I asked, wait, she starved herself and her poems for similar reasons? Not for body. She didn't have what we would call body image issues now. But she, well, she lived with her mother her whole adult life until she, her mother died in 1947. And this made its way into her poetry? I don't even know how to really answer that. So one thing, by the time she was doing her severe revising, her mother had died, and she was not quite so disordered as she used to be. The other thing is that I think a lot of her revision was driven by a desire to please her mother. Her mom was intimately involved in her writing. Her mother read every word and more quoted her mother in her writing. I mean, they were really quite the linked pair. I was curious what White thought of a study which came out in 2002 that looked at the word frequency in poems from a group of about 20 poets, some of whom had committed suicide and some who hadn't. They found only one word more frequent in the suicide group. I asked her to guess. She didn't. The correct answer is I. I was going to say that. That is interesting. That is interesting. I mean, yeah, Berryman, Plath, Lowell. These are all the great confessionals, whereas people like Moore and Bishop effectively never use it. I thought back to mirrors and imitation and elegance, about how it all seemed to fit, how at Rage Ground one woman who used to be a therapist had said the mirror was her favorite object to smash. Not because she didn't recognize herself, but rather precisely because she did. And this association, like with manners, like with elegance, was also about restraint and reduction. Like Sidney Brenner saying organisms had to evolve to be bilateral before they could be symmetric, before they could be elegant. Sullivan seemed to be saying that the necessary step before elegance is constraint, a kind of reduced entropy at the closure of expectation. Only then can one achieve surprise. Robert Pinsky added to this something fascinating, that even the structures of Shakespearean sonnets tell a story of imitation, elegance, and class. Quote, when modern English was new in the 16th century, Sir Philip Sidney from the family at the very top of the social order translated the sonnet sequence of Francesco Petrarca. Sidney was too elite and elegant and high class to publish it, but it was pirated and there were hundreds of imitations of those sonnets. We remember perhaps four or five of them, mainly Shakespeare's. Shakespeare's is one of many, many imitators of Sidney's imitation of Petrarch. It was a way for this increasingly literate middle class to associate itself with the manners of the court and it almost as a byproduct, advance the writing of English poetry, said Pinsky. And so, the history of the stunted, gnarled, complex tree of the English language, which allows us to say so much in so little an effort as I. It's ironic that her name was Moore, huh? It is a bit. She was maybe told too much, <laughs> less is more. <laughs> and she, took, she confused it with more is less. And... <laughs> Starve it down and let it run. And she took that from her is poetry it? and applied it to her body. Yeah, everything is. Uh, every, uh, you named more. It's like the person. The wasn't in Freakonomics. There was uh, the, someone named their kids winner and loser, and uh, winner ended up being a loser, and loser ended up being a winner. Like the opposite of nominal determinism. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. oh, so more ended up being just defining herself by being less. So there's two meta things I find inter interesting there. One, I had definitely pre-promised incorrectly how long it would be. And so people probably felt this overburdened anxiety about how I had included too much, which is the point. Thank you. I did that on purpose. Oh, you did. Yeah, but also course. they could see you holding the pages so you could actually see like how much you is left. See a little bit left. Well, but I, I, that tension is exactly the tension. Should he reduce? <coughs> is he saying too much? Is uh -huh. there the gnarled complexity of of reduction right the whole point is that you reduce it down and you lose some of that you lose the the feeling of being lost you lose that tension of too much um and also but i did as well live edit some paragraphs raw which was very very difficult to have to choose at each uh, like inflection choice point like am i going to skip this paragraph yes or no because i did also feel the anxiety of it going too long i woke so up I live editing i woke up uh, a few weeks ago with this vision of a bumper sticker, which I then had to like figure out how to have made. And now it's very big on my, uh, uh, on my pickup truck. It says more minimalism with an explanation point. With uh, one O and more. Can you make yeah. me one that's more M O O R E? <laughs> yeah. M O O R E minimalism. <laughs> but, uh, 
I, I just like the uh, the absurdity of also shouting it out and having it be this big, obnoxious bumper sticker that just says more minimalism. Yeah, there's one that says uh, issue obfuscation, which I've always liked. <laughs> That's good, too. <laughs> I like that. But um, so but I, I we, we've gone from. Uh, I want to go back to elegance more broadly, I think. Well, so, I mean, about class and imitation, right? Like I read this partly because how did, how did you, you started this with, okay, your, your father was elegant, your family elegant, you know, but they are also princes and, you know, high class. And they're at the very end, these imitations of upper nobility, like the literal, the, the concept, the structure of a sonnet is an imitative act. It's imitating what others above do and so there's hierarchy everywhere there's hierarchy when these women are in this room and they can't express their rage you know at work or out in public or else they get labeled mad so they have to go into the private confines of this room and pay money <laughs> to out to outlet their aggression i and just feel like 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 elegance seems to be to me the opposite of imi imitation uh, because it seems to ha require a certain authenticity to it so i would say so like the word snob right the the uh etymology is sans nobilité without nobility because someone who has to put on airs of being noble probably isn't actually noble right if they have to act like whereas i think one of the things that made my father so loved is that he was never snobby right he was always just heartfelt and himself and made everybody feel like they were equally important and his manners were like not put on for show but they were actually like deeply ingrained in him and he would treat somebody in the street with the same you know uh respect and and uh and and class again that's a purposefully uh a challenging use of that word but like then he would you know, somebody who came from the upper classes, let's say, right? So I feel like, um, and then some of my, you know, some of the great examples of elegance for me would be like also just great musicians, whether it's Miles Davis or Manuel Molina, the flamenco poet that I made a, a film about, or Lightning Hopkins, there's this great movie called The Blues According to Lightning Hopkins. And just his whole way of of touching the guitar, um, it, it would not if it was imitative this there's a there's a paradox there because like to be a great flamenco guitar player or a great blues player you have to embody the tradition a hundred percent and be a hundred percent original and there's this beautiful uh tension there between being able to, to to do both those things at the same time because you you're not imitating the tradition but you're embodying it and you know that it's so in you that then you're able to express it in your unique way and to me, like a true sense of elegance will have those things. It will understand that there are rules about manners and and do the correct things. But I don't know. People used to talk about like it's bad manners considered to like uh, take your bread at the end of the meal and sop up the food. Right. And um, but what's much worse is like there's this middle class thing to do that they know that that's bad manners. So they take a fork and they put it in the bread and then they go like this and then eat the bread and that's considered like so tacky because what you should do is you should know that it's wrong but do it anyway because it's delicious and if somebody's sufficiently elegant and has sufficient good manners they could might be able to get away with doing that but either don't do it at all or do it with your hands but don't do this halfway thing right of like right. or like holding the teacup with your pinky up that was known to be like a a mafia thing right mm -hmm. pretending to be elegant by by having this false sense of delicateness delicacy when actually they're cold-blooded killers right whereas maybe a truly elegant person would just grab the cup you know or just like take the wine glass like with their fist instead of like pretending like daint daintiness right so i think of elegance i remember uh, there was one more thing there was an interview with miles davis that i was watching uh, on youtube and they asked him how do you choose the musicians you play with and it occurred to me as he was answering that obviously anyone who's auditioning for Miles Davis is already a great musician. And therefore, this answer makes sense. And he says, I watch the way they hold the guitar or the instrument while they walk in the room. I watch the way they walk. I watch the way they sit down. And that tells him more about their unique personality right. than whatever technique they end up showing off. Right. There's this possibly apocryphal story uh, that had circled in my family, which is just my mom 
that that's code for my mom told me a story once, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> which was that uh, Sean Connery hadn't acted perhaps much when he uh, uh, applied to be James Bond, right? He auditioned mm-hmm. to be Bond, and that they said in the thing at the end, sorry, you d- you're not going to get the part, but that the guy was uh, uh, sitting, the producer or casting director was sitting by the window and watched Sean Connery walk away, having just been rejected. And he said it looked like he owned the sidewalk. Mm. And he said that's the intangible quality of bond that we need. Like even after social rejection, you can still put your shoulders up and own the street. And so yeah. I, I think the, the, the way you carry yourself very much indicates. Um, so, so like, but but we have to tease apart like is that grace is that confidence you know and how do these relate to elegance in some sense because i i I totally take your point that with a snob there's like a detectable level of intentional mimicry right and elegance is the the like 0.01 percent where you can effortlessly defy the rules in some way that just some people get away with some people are some people have it and Pinsky has this other quote, it's not in this chapter, about how you can cultivate grace, but you can't cultivate elegance. You you either have it or you don't. And that's what I kind of, I, I kind of, I, I, I inherently disagree with that in some sense because I feel like it's a, a trained thing. People are elegant by virtue of decades of hidden practice and it's about who can, who can hide the most with the least. And, but, but it is true that like, adherence to rules um, is often used as a marker of this kind of thing and, but but it is the people at the top of the hierarchies that are allowed to get away with things in my laboratory my, I, I remember in the one lab in but maybe that's how it lab, should be because they're the ones who actually have achieved the ability to do that with responsiveness to the unique situation rather than with um, a blunt you know inappropriateness I don't know there's a there's a difference between flouting the rules because you don't know what you're doing, yes. You know, yes, and there's a, and and doing it because you know better than the rules what so, to do. So I went to the DRC. I went to the Congo to interview those the the Gentleman Society, right? And their response was very similar to what you were saying about how you have to understand a hundred percent of the the history, and the legacy of the thing, but you also have to be a hundred percent original. And they said, what appears to the outside Westerner who comes, this is me the outside Westerner who comes and thinks they have a theory of everything and thinks they can explain our psychology and thinks they understand why it is that I put on my Italian loafers. Uh, what they think it is, is imitation of Belgian colonial European fashion. But what it really is, is taking the legacy of what was once used to oppress us and owning it 100%. So it's taking yeah, like that. the decades of this is the rule these are the rules by which you live these are the fashion styles by which you can mark your class structure and we have given you that but improvising atop that and saying no we are owning this yeah we are making the rules now and we are not hiding from our past we are owning it and so i do feel there's a bit of an artistic kind of um, exploration there where they're taking the foundation and adding their own elements which is the heart of so much of this and, and of course, in Heidegger, there's the concept of authenticity and in existentialism. And it's always been a bit problematic for a lot of the same reasons that you have problems with elegance, I think. Yeah. Um, but I do think there's something to the idea that an acknowledgement, a deep seated acknowledgement in your way of doing things and being that 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 understands again, understanding seems too intellectual, but like knows that the rules and the foundations are groundless and thereby gets a certain amount of freedom of movement right so if you if you know that the 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 manners for example they're arbitrary to a certain degree and 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 that's what allows you the freedom to respond to the unique situation you know rather than uh than having to be rigid with them and so explained by manners being arbitrary. So, so what I find interesting, and the reason that chapter is called "Elegance is Restraint," is because I had interviewed someone who t- teaches manners in in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and a hundred percent of the teaching is about specifically table manners and like how to be at cocktail parties and what to do, and it's about inhibiting movements. It's when you reach for something, you reach for it with like the efficient arc line between the two. You know, from point A to point B, if you're just trying to grab the butter, you 
you don't waste movements. You know exactly where to place things. You know exactly what to do. And most of the time, nobility, especially this kind of Western English European nobility, is about composure and restraint in your body. And that's what I loved about the rage room. That's what I loved about taking these poems. Like how, wh when does restraint go too far? And so, but manners to me don't feel arbitrary in the sense that they do have this, this, this pervasive theme of doing less. To be mannered is to do less. Interesting. No, I see it as like, I don't know, I'm thinking of the, of the things that I like about going to Italy and seeing these kind of manifestations of old fashioned manners. So for example, um, my father would always make sure that everybody's glasses are full of water or wine, for example, right? And there was this, um, you know, if, if somebody you see, especially a woman like pouring her own wine, that's terrible. Like you'd have to like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, let me let me do that ah, for you. That's the bullshit. And from then the beginning the like, oh, manual of etiquette with hints on politeness and good breeding. It's like the woman shouldn't have to do. You know, the woman should. But then still. So, so the snobby yeah. women like I've seen this at like, you know, the overly rigid dinner parties where like the woman will say, excuse me, Dad, will you pour me a glass of wine? You know, that's terrible. But there's this beauty to like her Knowing. reaching for it. Yeah. And and you getting there in, in advance and saying, oh, I'm so sorry. And then there's this moment you share. Right. And there's like there's an undercurrent of, of you know, so like, for example, in in in, uh, in in Italy, they would never seat a couple together at a dinner party. Right. And if there's different tables, better to seat them at different tables. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. And they laugh at Americans. And it's a, it's a kind of a a uh, a signal of the youth of the culture that doesn't hasn't understood many things. Right. That they would seat couples together. There's nothing more boring <laughs> than sitting next to a couple. There is this insular thing. There's that. nothing more boring for the couple to go home and have nothing to talk about because they were together all night long. Yeah, yeah, of There's nothing ter worse than for a couple in the long run than not to have at least some form of flirtation or interaction with the opposite sex that can like make one feel alive again, you know, you know whether or not you act on that in any way. Right. Yeah. There's all this deeply nuanced, like understanding of what it is to be human that's embedded in these manners of not seating couples together. And if, if, um, and the default position of like, oh, we're together and we're going to come sit here. It seems like just crass in a way. And I remember b b at a wedding, I don't want to say who it was, but um, someone in my family was getting married to an American and she they were arguing. They were reading the books on manners for setting up the wedding. And there was the American one and the and the Italian one. And my brother was my brother. Yeah, I gave course. it away. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's fine. It, it, this, this wedding is marriage has ended anyway. Um <laughs> as many years ago and I have many brothers uh, <laughs> so he says um, the Italian book like takes for granted like so many basic things and the American one seems to like just start at the much much lower level right and so they were arguing about who should sit how they should do the seating and in the end she won the argument because it is very weird for Americans not to sit together as couples yeah. you know yeah. And so they put the couples, they put the couples together. And I, I, I overheard this Italian couple looking at the seating chart, ready, getting ready to sit down. They said, they said with great kind of disdain, like, did they do the seating chart alphabetically? <laughs> <laughs> like, because people with the same last name were sitting together. And um, so, but that would be inelegant to do it alphabetically. It's a kind of, very. The, but so there's the an way... overly simplistic, uh, but that's about uh, that no, a nuance. Yeah. So but even even then, that's the structure of a dinner party. That's the structure of arrangement of people. And so that's I, I that the theme, a theme of that chapter about the structure of a sonnet. Does that allow for more expression or less? A structure of a glamour, a spell, a hallucinatory spell that's cast over. Like, do those do those enhance the potential for elegance or not? Do they? So I, I love the idea of taking this kind of Italian couples philosophy to the limit, like arguing that a. Uh, uh, Perhaps the most romantic thing two people in in love could do is just spend the rest of their lives apart. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, like, why converge back at the end of the evening? You mm -hmm. could, like, I would love that so much if the the person I most loved, great idea. Uh, we agreed that because of and by virtue of our love, uh, it it would be best if we could experience the most and then maybe meet. You know, the most never longing, again. never yeah, again. The most longing, never again. Um, anyway, I do think that there's, I, I, I resist, you know, I have this dual 
personality and upbringing and having been half Californian and half Roman and half hippie and half aristocratic. And like, um, I do think I do see the pros and cons of each. So like my father, you weren't allowed to just drop in on him and uh, you had to call first. So there were these kind of even though he was kind of wild and 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 uh, uh, rebellious, he did have certain things that he stuck with. But then I noticed, for example, that the reason he wanted people to call before they came over, when they came over, they would all his attention would be on them yeah. and it would just be his 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 manners and and his the, the fame with which he just treated everybody took a lot of effort right mm -hmm. so i have the opposite anybody's allowed to come by here go for a swim uh you know the door's unlocked go ahead and come by but i probably won't pay that much attention to you if i'm yeah. busy like i i i prefer to have the freedom of the california un a historical you know new fresh uh, anarchic way of being but i think that there is that there's a there's a give and take in each and i and i do think there's something there's, there is something lost in each in each uh, kind of uh way of approaching and i'm sure in, in science when you do seek that elegance and that simplicity there's that famous letter of Bertrand Russell where that he ended after like 20 pages saying, I'm, I'm sorry to have written you such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a shorter one. That's right? precisely it. That's precisely it. I didn't have time to reduce this down to three lines. Marianne Moore's poem, Poetry, starts hundreds and hundreds of lines. And she, over the course of 30 years, she just cut and cut and cut until at the end it was three. Yeah. And French cooking is the same, right? Like I feel like, and editing a movie, I always say editing a movie is like French cooking in the sense that you have to throw all these things in and then you boil it and you boil it and like eventually you get the essence, but it's tiny amount, right? Rather than, uh, but all those flavors are still in there somehow. So musically, what did you think of the Miles Davis story? Can I read it again to you? George, no, 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 remember I remember it? it. I remember it. And I was, and, I was thinking of- What does that mean to you? Because I, I have no, I'm atonal. I don't understand music at all, so. No, 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 but I, I, I would you... be surprised that the that the drummer wouldn't do be able to do exactly what he what he says. I was, I was curious about that. Um, and the, <sighs> the idea that saying, so this is kind of like, a, it's, it's, it's similar to that dinner table with the woman who's reaching for the glass of wine that you're talking about. By virtue of her, in some sense, elegance, there's a scene in a, in a breakfast at Tiffany's, right? Audrey Hepburn, she takes out a cigarette with a cigarette hold, like those operatic cigarette holders, right? And she brings it to her mouth, and as soon as she does, a stranger lights it. That's how it was. From Italy. behind. So I love that. She doesn't that. even break eye contact with no. who she's talking about. A man just comes yeah. up and lights it from behind. And she didn't have to say anything. It was just with her consummate grace. She. I'll, I'll reach for I reach for women's lighters to light their cigarettes sometimes, and they, they'll like grab yeah. it, think that I'm stealing their lighter or something, <laughs> right? So I do miss that. It's, there's a beauty, because also, like, when you would light a woman's cigarette, it was also considered, it's an unspoken rule that she might put her hand on yours while you do it and make, make eye contact with you right? right and these are these just delicious like uh rituals that have grown over thousands of years and they they cause these they, this wonderful little tension you know romantic sexual yeah. and and of course you can want to reject that and of course you know there's this famous stories of like in the 60s of feminists who say don't fucking hold the door open for me i can hold my own door open right but then there's an, a new kind of wave of saying, yes, we can be feminist, but also appreciate these rituals because they're they're lovely like forms of interaction. And and, and but if it's based on a backdrop of equality, then maybe we can actually re-embrace them. Do you ever think about how the rules of chivalry might have to adapt for ghosts? In what sense? For ghosting on like text? No, stuff? no, no. Like literal ghosts. Or, I mean, oh. not literal because they don't exist. But, you know, the ghost world the after we all die. You know, ghosts running around. But if you can just walk through walls, you're going to have to adapt. Like, what is chivalry? <laughs> if you don't have to hold it at a door open. Right, you, I confess I've never thought about you this. you got nothing. I've spent like three years thinking about this. Really? Yeah. Uh, so so I, I feel like that's similar to the Audrey Hepburn, the, the effortless ability in that scene to to express intentionality. To, like, just by virtue of her action, she expressed to some circle around her, this is what I need. I need light. She didn't have come with her own light. And the Miles Davis story where the, the way that it worked to get the tempo correct was to say nothing. The woman at the dinner party who can say nothing and be offered because people are paying attention to the fact that her wine glass is being diminished slowly. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it's like 90 percent done, someone refills it. That's the kind of thing that not everybody has. And I tr I'm trying to understand what are the qualities of 
someone? Is it their manners? Is it their beauty? Is it just the way they hold themselves? Is, the, is it their regality that that makes people notice with their makes people notice their effort that their effortlessness is not empty that their effortlessness still comes with needs and desires that want to be fulfilled and that they might not express them and that it's more elegant to keep things like unexpressed do you know you know the famous story of edith piaf going to the dinner where they had the little bowls for the uh for washing the hands so this was a story of like a very, she came from a very, uh, you know, working class background. And then she became this famous singer and she was invited to this, you know, elegant dinner party. And there were these little bowls to wash your fingers before eating something with your hands. And she thought it was drinking water. And so she took the bowl and, and there was like the beginnings of some snickering around by this, the snobs, right? The people who like, and the host being a truly elegant person, and not wanting to her feel to feel uncomfortable or like she's done something wrong also took the cup and drank from it that right is elegance, yes. and that is and then everybody else got the hint and they did that and and i know in italy like That's since i didn't grow up here there i remember um going to like some cousins who are very upper class you know very elegant uh see i'm putting i'm mixing the two together uh everybody but does. they they um I, I, I heard that they, they served penne pasta because they knew we were I was coming with my little brother in case I didn't know the proper way of turning the spaghetti on the fork and because Americans are famous for like, you know, doing this in an ugly way and maybe like using a knife or, or doing other things that are, it's difficult to eat spaghetti properly, okay? So rather than uh, cause us that possible embarrassment or or pitfall into bad manners they made sure to serve something that, that wouldn't allow for that you know yeah. so i i love from a aesthetic point of view and a as a lover of human interaction in in a deep and nuanced way i think all these things are can be wonderful um but they 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 have to be done in a way that's not snobby not inauthentic and done in a way that is truly elegant and i think some of the pro you're in a way you're doing a straw man in my eyes when you're attacking elegance because you're attacking a uh a, an inauthentic elegance it seems like sometimes uh, i'm attacking the specific quality that the editor of a scientific journal said was important to their decision making process Right. So it's like in order to be the best scientist, you need to understand the aesthetic and scientific criteria by which things are judged. So it's really it's it's not so much about the concept. It's about the human the human judgment around the concept. How it, how is it the case that we we perceive some things as elegant when they're efficient, that we define them as such? Uh, if that wasn't Edith walking in and drinking out of the hand washing bowl. If it was someone that nobody knew, if that it was, would be truly elegant. See, that's the thing. That's the. But that's would what the I would, but would the host have come in and 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 uh, solved the situation? No. A truly elegant host truly would have done it. Even would have, what, that. That's. But it's of no law. The story is. It's not lost on me that Edith was already famous. Right. So this is still just hierarchical imitation. Right. The host just yeah. has established herself, his or his self, yeah. at that moment as beneath Edith. Right. So, but so it, that's but that's a great that's a great thing about elegance and good manners is that you do make everybody feel super important, and you don't uh, self-aggrandize, and and then you do feel like everybody feels like they need to be that you you become the servant, right? Yeah. As that's that's the beautiful way of seeing that. That's why I need to light your cigarette. Why I need to pour your wine. Right. Not because you're less than and you're not able to, but because I am here to make you feel like important right and that's what everybody would say about people with charisma whether it's bill clinton or my father or these people that they say they they always say the same thing like you feel like you're the only one in the room they feel like they're really looking at you and it's it's a lot about that so extending from an individual there's this like cone of attention cone of importance that you feel like you feel important to be nearby is that what you mean? yeah i think so yeah yeah and then there's and then the opposite is someone who makes people feel like they're just thinking about themselves you know uh one of my favorite kind of one-off uh, monographs from psychiatry is uh like the, i think the 1950s there's this paper in a small uh, psychiatric journal about a man whose compulsion whose mental illness is a, a constant desire to be injured by a woman driving an automobile and so he would continually put himself in situations where he would be run over or get hit 
uh, he even extended it so far as to sometimes while the car was running he would put his mouth over the tailpipe of the car uh, <clears throat> and to me that's to me that's the same structure of injury that elegance has wrought on the world the other, see the other, the, the other story. I'm gonna keep defending it. The other story <laughs> I love of, of of an elegant and good elegance and good manners, and we should probably stop after this because it's we're 59 minutes in. Um, is uh, supposedly Winston Churchill was at a dinner party, a cocktail party, and there was two Fabergé eggs, you know, very expensive art Russian art pieces, on the mantle of the fireplace, and somebody he noticed grabbed one of them and put it in his pocket. And rather than say, hey, thief, stop him, he like walked up next to him. He took the other egg, put it in his pocket, and then whispered to the guy, I think somebody's seeing us. We should put them back. So <laughs> even making the thief not feel, uh, yeah, yeah. you know. So anyway, I think this is a conversation that can be ongoing. Let's stop for today because we're, we're an hour in. Yeah. Um, but I, and I was worried that we, I would have nothing to say today. I'm, I'm glad we just always jump in head first. And, and, and have these super inelegant conversations. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. See you all tomorrow. Bye.